taking a, a different look at Christmas um, this, this past couple of weeks. And the whole point is, uh, you know, it's the traditional message, everybody, the baby in the manger, um, you know, and giving of the gifts and things like that. But I said this a couple of weeks ago, that we really need to understand what happened behind the scenes. We really need to understand why Jesus became man, why the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And last week, we gave kind of a uh, little illustration up here of man, Jesus, Christ, and God to kind of show you why Jesus was man and God and why we needed someone to bring the two together, someone who needed to, who could bring man and God together, and there was only one person, and that was Jesus Christ or Jesus the Christ. And Jesus is 100% man and 100% God. And so I kind of showed you, and a lot of people said, wow, that really now it explains why Jesus is who he is. He's man and God at the same time. And so I wanted to really do a little bit more with that today. And Christmas Eve and Christmas Sunday, we'll do our traditional, you know, Hark the Herald's Angels Sing, you know, all the cr traditional uh, uh, sermons. Uh, but I wanted to really get into some behind-the-scenes um, look at the Word that became flesh. Really, really, really get deep into it tonight, this morning. So this title of my message is The Greatest Undercover Rescue Mission of All Time. The greatest undercover rescue mission of all time. Because what God did was an amazing undercover rescue mission. It was a black ops, undercover, clandestine, CIA, KGB. Everybody kind of worked together. And he did an undercover rescue mission to rescue you and me. And that's what Christmas was all about. And so we'll get into that. All right? It'll give you a lot of scriptures. Amen? Amen. Let's go to Romans. Yeah. Even the angels said amen. He'll fix it. Romans chapter 3. We'll start there. So let's give you some foundational scriptures. Romans chapter 3. And like I said, this is just kind of real nitty gritty. Right down to where you live. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. This is not your traditional Christmas message because, you know, sometimes, and, and you, I, don't, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm, not, I'm still a young man, but sometimes you get to the point where is this what Christmas is all about? It's running around, you know, hitting uh, the sales, buying the gifts. Christmas parties and all that, and then you forget what if it's it, that it's all about Jesus, and sometimes it you lose the whole significance of it because it gets washed away in the materialist materialistic part of what we've made Christmas, you know the parties and Santa and you know the reindeer and uh, you know you know what I mean I mean they're fun I'm not trying to knock it, knock Santa. I don't want him to put a lump of coal in my stocking on Saturday night. But that's not really what it's all about. And we kind of, we, we, we glamorize it and not realize that God became man to live with us and to rescue us from our sin, from ourselves. So Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says this, For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone. And I really went into detail the past couple of weeks about genealogy and how we're all in Adam. Remember that? And how we've all sinned. We were all born with original sin. Romans 5.12. Give you another scripture. Romans 5.12 says that therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin and thus death, death spread to all men because all have sinned. Uh, then in verse uh, 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. But the free gift is not like the offense. 
For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, and abound to many. Verse 18, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. So through Adam, sin entered the world. Through Adam, death entered the world. In Adam, we all die, we all fall short. So do you notice the pattern? It's all Adam's fault. It's all because of Adam and his sin. Now remember what I said, and some of this may, may be review, but remember what I said. I said Eve was deceived. She was tricked into sinning. Adam wasn't. So in a court of law, if you're tricked into something, if you're not told the truth and there was deception behind a contract or something like that, it is not legal. But if you willingly sign a document then it is perfectly legal. So when Adam sinned, it made it perfectly legal for Satan to take over the world. So God holds Adam accountable. He doesn't, he doesn't hold Eve accountable. And, I know a lot, and so that's why God put Adam as the head or the man as the head and the wife not as the head or the woman not as the head for the simple reason is that man is, is responsible. God holds him accountable, not the woman. Good? It's not about... Yeah. It, ladies, you get a pass. So it's not because man is better. It's because man really, really messed up. It's his fault that we're in this. If Adam, if, if Adam did not sin, and even though Eve did there would be no death in the world. There would be no sin in the world. But because Adam willingly chose to sin, she offered it to him, he said yes. Therefore, it became legal, and he sold all of humanity into slavery. And that's the slavery of sin. Now, Eve came from where? Eve came out of Adam, right? I want you to think about this. So the Bible says, Adam said, she is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Eve came out from Adam, so that means she had his flesh, she had his bones, she had his blood. Good? So she came out of Adam. Now here's, because she came out of Adam, she was in Adam. Any child she gave birth to was in Adam because every man Every, every woman has to have a man to have a child, correct? So we said this, that the woman is the carrier, but the man is the one who passes on sin. So how do you bring in someone into this world that is not in Adam? You have to have a father who is not of Adam. Someone outside of Adam's line. Now, I'll just throw this out. If you believe in evolution, that means there is no Adam and Eve, but there are many Adam and Eves, right? That means that there's more than one man that came from an ape. Just follow me on this. I'm not preaching evolution. But if you believe in evolution, then you don't need a savior because you're not in Adam. I want you to think about that. People who believe in evolution do not need a savior because somewhere somebody did not come from Adam's line because somebody walked up right from being an ape. But everything comes through Adam. And because of that, we need a savior for mankind. You guys, could do, yeah, that's just, just think that through a little bit. Okay, good? Everybody good? All right, so... Now, let's get into the nitty-gritty. Um, uh, the greatest rescue mission that ever, ever took place. Have you ever seen a movie called Argo? Anybody? Great movie. 
Uh, it's about the Iran hostage situation. Back in 1979, 1980, when the Shah of Iran was given asylum here in the United States, uh, the Iranian people stormed the United States Embassy. They took the hostages, remember the 400, for 400 days, I forget how many hostages, but about six people escaped and they were hiding with some Canadian people. And the movie Argo is about the undercover rescue mission that rescued, that went into Iran and rescued these six American hostages or American people who were hiding in Iran. Now, there was this guy named, and everybody know who the CIA is, right? The CIA is the Central Intelligence Agency. They are the spies of the United States. Uh, Russia has the KGB, right? Uh, Israel has the Mossad. England has James Bond. That's all. They only need James Bond. They don't need anybody else. 007, because he's amazing. So all these spies... They live undercover. They live a life where they go into the enemy's camp. They go into the enemy's camp to rescue people, to bring them out of wherever they're at. So this guy, the CIA, this CIA operative, he was the number one in extraditing people or going in undercover and rescuing them. His name was Tony Mendez. And it's in the, it's in the movie, but he's a real person. This was a real, this really happened. So Tony Mendez goes into Iran as a Canadian film producer. And he brings fake passports for these six Americans that are there hiding. And he gives them fake passports, uh, fake names, fake identities. And the whole thing is that as they, uh, they become Canadians and they're supposed to be there doing a film for a new Star Wars movie. So, so they, now they're, they're getting out. He's in there. It's all undercover. He takes them to the airport. They're getting on the plane, and, they, and the uh, Iranian royal guard figures out, uh-oh, we think we've been duped. Let's go get them and kill them. So the whole movie ends when they're on the plane, and they're running down the runway in a Swiss air, Swiss jet, and the Iranian royal guard is trying to now storm the airport, but they take off and they're free. He rescues them, all undercover, all, all for a rescue mission. It is considered the number one greatest rescue mission that ever occurred of all time. Now, God did the same thing. God said, I need to go undercover and send one man, an extraditing specialist, into the humanity, pose as one of them, but finally rescue them out of their sin and slavery. Jesus was the undercover operative. Jesus was the secret spy of heaven who came in born of a virgin, born in a manger, born of lowliness of character. He came in undercover. Nobody knew who he was. Nobody knew why he was there. Nobody understood how a virgin would give birth. But he was born in a feeding trough. There was no room in the inn. He wasn't even born in a hospital. He was born somewhere where no one would understand why he was there. And his whole purpose for coming into this world was to rescue us. It was the greatest undercover rescue mission of all kind. And I want to prove it to you because even the devil didn't know that Jesus was there to rescue us. Woo! Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. <coughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Check this out. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 7, 1 Corinthians 2, 7, it says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Ready? 
which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The New Living Translation says this, The wisdom we speak is the mystery of God. His plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began, but the rulers of the world had not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. So I want you to think about this, that even the devil, the Bible says, had no clue who Jesus was until he was 30 years old. We see nothing. Remember the wise men come to Herod and say, we've come to see he who was born king of the Jews. And what does Herod do? Who is this guy? Where did he come from? He's born in my town. So what does he do? He has no clue who he is. He says, let's kill every kid under the age of two years old. Because the devil had no clue that Jesus is born, that God became man. God is now on the earth alive and well and he's out for one mission and that's to rescue you and me out of slavery and sin and the devil didn't even know it it happened under his watch listen when you're when you when everything is going bad in your life i want you to know this that god is up to something he is working undercover you may not see it. You're not supposed to see it because God works undercover. He's got spies. He's got angels. He's got the Holy Spirit, and he's doing things, and all he asks you is just trust me. The ultimate rescue mission was to rescue us out of Adam's sin, out of Satan's grip, and God did the plan flawlessly. Yeah. Bible says he never sleeps or slumbers. So when you're going to sleep and all hell is breaking loose in your house or in your family or on your job, just know that God is not sleeping. God is up to something. God has just initiated a rescue mission on your behalf. The Bible says this in Colossians 1.13, that, that God rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and he brought us into the kingdom of the, of, of the son of his love, into the marvelous light. Woo-wee! Listen, the angels, when the angels sang, right? They, remember the angels came to the shepherds on the night that Jesus was born? They sang, they said, born, you know, peace and goodwill towards men, right? Why? Because they're saying, man, you don't even know what's going on right now. God has just initiated the plan of all time, the greatest rescue mission, and you're about to get set free. And they had no clue. The shepherds had no clue. The wise men had no clue. They show up with gold, frankincense, and myrrh, have no clue what God is up to. But 33 years later, boy, the, 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 everything broke loose. Hell, hell broke loose. The grave broke loose. Couldn't hold the rescue mission, the man that God had sent to deliver you and me. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, interesting. He goes, you think I've come to bring peace? I've come to bring a sword. He was giving clues. He's dropping clues at that point. He says, I came to destroy the works of the devil. He started healing people, raising dead people, and the devil's like, oh no, what did I just let happen? What is going on? And so what did the devil do? He said, if I can't get him to sin, I'll just kill him and get rid of him. By the time the devil figured out who Jesus was, that the Word became flesh and was dwelling among us, that God was actually walking the earth. Think about it. 30 years, Jesus is walking the earth. God is walking the earth. And the devil has no clue what he's about to do. When he figures it out, he, he finds him in the desert. And for 40 days, he beats on him and he tempts him to sin. And he said, listen, I got Adam to sin. If I get you to sin, I've destroyed God forever. 
And when he doesn't, when 40 days he comes out, Jesus comes out with the power of the Spirit of God upon him, now the devil is worried. And now the devil is doing a plan. And the next three years he devises a plan to crucify him. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says, man, if, if the devil knew what God was up to, he would never have crucified him. Because that was the biggest mistake of his life. God had a backup plan and a backup to the backup plan. He says, I know man is going to sin. He, said, but he says, before the foundation of the world, the Bible says that God already had a plan. He had the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. God said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go down there. I'm going to kick some, you know what? And then I'm going to let them kill me. Because when they kill me, boy, it's all over. I'm going to rise again on the third day. So your family may be a mess. Your job, your boss may hate you or he's making life difficult for you. The moment you've prayed, God has initiated a rescue mission on your behalf. I want you to know God's already working for some of you. Some of you, 2016 has not been the best year. You've got two weeks left and I'm telling you, all of heaven is working on your behalf. God is doing things. He's just waiting for the proper time, the proper place, and the proper people to bring you in your life. I said, who, who was it? I, it I, we went, were out with Lisa and, you know, Janice and I, and Lisa went out the other night, and, and we were talking about people that don't like you. And I said, listen, if they don't like you, they can leave. Because they're not part of your life where God is taking you. God's got a rescue mission. God's got a plan for my life. And if you leave, that means you're not part of my destiny. Listen, Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's part of your life. He's part of your destiny. As long as he's in there, I don't care who likes me or doesn't like me. Let me tell you, 2016, you may have seen people leave you in your life, but I'm telling you, they were not ordained to be a part of your life. God has other people waiting in the wings to grab a hold of you, to stand with you, to pray with you, to encourage you, and to get you where God needs you to go. 2017 will be like no other year ever on this earth. Because the plan of God is winding down, and God has already commissioned many hosts of angels to help you out. Isaiah chapter 9. <clears throat> I started this series with Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, right? For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. That's where we started. So let me end it with this. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. I said from the very beginning that's two people. A child was born, a son was given. God can't be born, so God has to be the son that was given. Only humans can be born. Adam, of course, wasn't born, and Eve wasn't born. You know the joke, right? If you line up Adam and Eve with a whole bunch of humans, how could you tell Adam and Eve? No belly button. <laughs> You're right. Whoever got that, you win. See me after service. No belly button. They weren't born. People are like, what do you mean? I don't, I don't have a belly button. <laughs> Listen, when you come out, God does this. You're done. You don't like the Pillsbury Doughboy? You're done. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. Never mind. All right. That's how God knows you're done when you come out. He presses your button. You're done. You can come out now. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 is where we started it. Let me read it. Uh, I should have been a comedian. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is... I'm not done yet. This is going to get even better. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. 
of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Think about who he's describing here. He's describing this person that is coming into the world. Isaiah is prophesying. Now, you would probably say, well, why did Isaiah do that? He's letting the devil know. No, the devil had no clue what's going on. He's prophesying this for us. This is a love letter. The Bible is a love letter to humanity. And what Isaiah is doing is saying, listen, guys, don't give up hope. Because there's going to be a child that is born and a son that's going to be given. And of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. And he's going to get greater and he will reign and rule forever. And he's creating a home for you and I. And he's going to rescue you and I from this crazy world called sin and death. You understand? Listen, how do you think when Tony Mendez went into Iran, how did he tell them what he was doing? The little secret messages that they're dropping. How about when you were in eighth grade and you liked this girl? What did you do? You wrote little notes and you left them in her book, right? So when she opened it, she go, turn around. I love you. <laughs> you drop secret messages. Did you do that to Anissa? You drop secret messages to let the person know don't give up hope. Hope is on the way. The Calvary is coming. And so what God does throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament, he prophesies, says, don't give up. He says, the army is just getting assembled, and we are on our way. We're just waiting for the blow. The trumpet. Listen, the same thing will happen when Jesus comes back. He's waiting for the trumpet of God to blow, the Bible says. And he'll jump off his seat in heaven, and he'll come down and rescue us once and for all. Now, now, so my question was to me, why did Isaiah 9-6 happen to be right there? Why did he choose to put it there? And why did he describe this amazing person that is going to come and the government, he's going to be wonderful, counselor, prince of peace. He's describing this amazing person. Why there? So, of course, biblical interpretation rules say read before and read after. Read it in context. Because if you take something out of context, you'll probably miss the whole meaning. For example, somebody said the Bible says there is no God. And they're right. It does say it. But if you don't read the stuff before it that says the fool has said there is no God, then you take the whole thing out of context. Correct? Correct? So, I said, let me take this into context. So I went to Isaiah and started reading from the first, uh, the chapter 9, the beginning. Start in chapter 2. Uh, verse 2, excuse me. Now we're not going to go all the way back to chapter 2. Verse 2. Let's read the context before. It says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Is that exciting? You're walking in darkness? He's prophesying future. He says, those who've walked in darkness, they'll see a great light. Watch this. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, are we living in the land of the shadow of death? Absolutely. Psalm 23, right? Though we walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Look, he says, upon them a light has shined. Ready? Wait, we're not done. It says, you have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. Didn't he say, declare joy when he came, when the angels came? Right? Watch this. They rejoice before you according to the joy of the harvest. As men rejoice when they div divide spoil. All I'm reading here is, man, something good's about to happen. Isaiah is saying, look out, people, because joy is coming. Peace is coming. There's going to be darkness, but light is going to explode, and this whole world is going to change. Then he says... For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor as in the day of Midian. He's talking about us, that God has broken the oppressor's hold. He's breaking every chain is what he's saying. That God broke the chains of sin and death, addiction and sickness and disease and all the things that come with living on this earth. He says he has broken those chains. He broke the staff and he set people free. Watch this. Then he says, as in the day of Midian. Now, now you, you sit there and it's like, wait, what does Midian have to do with all this? He's saying something happened at the day of Midian 
that's going to be like the day that Jesus is born. And we'll continue next week. No, I'm just kidding. Ah. Oh. No, 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 no. Let's finish. Look, for every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and the garments rolled in blood will be used for burning fuel and fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Ready? So what does Midian have to do with the birth of Jesus Christ? What happened the day of Midian? Because apparently what happened then was so great, so marvelous, it was an act of God like no other, that God's going to about to do the same thing on the day that Jesus is born. Now, if you have your Bibles, look, it says Judges chapter 7, doesn't it, next to it? So it tells you exactly where the day of Midian is, right? Some of you have those fancy Bibles with all the cross references. 722, that's right. So let me give it to you real quick. The day of Midian was with this guy named Gideon. Anybody remember Gideon? Gideon and his 300 men, right? Everybody know Gideon? No? I could do a quick teaching on Gideon. You stay for another hour. Gideon, listen. So here's Gideon. Remember his 300 men. Gideon is a man. He's a warrior. He's the least of the least, the Bible says. And God shows up and says, Gideon, you're, the, you're a mighty man of valor. You're a champion, and I'm going to use you to deliver Israel out of the Midianites' hands. Now, ready? Midian was, was over, overflowing in Israel. Midian was taking their land. Midian, the Midianites were everywhere. And, and Gideon and the Israelites had given up hope. There was no light. There was no peace. They just saw nothing but death. And so God shows up and he says, Gideon, you're going to deliver them. So Gideon says, all right, I've got 30,000 men. And God says, no, get rid of most of them. So what does Gideon do? He says, all right, whoever wants to stay and fight, stay. Everybody else can leave. 20,000 men leave, 10,000 stay. So, God, so Gideon goes to God and says, I got 10,000. And God says, too many. So Gideon's like, what, are you kidding me? He says, we can't even beat them with 10,000. And God is like, that's the point. I'm going to do it. I just want you to do what I tell you to do. I'm going to make this a defeat of epic proportions. He says, why? Because I don't want anybody to say that Israel did it. I want the world to say that God did it, that God rescued man. So what does he do? He says, all right, take all these men and go bring them for water. And those that lap like a dog, those are the ones I want with you. So 300 men are the ones that lap water like a dog. They, you know, like drink like that. So God says, all right, those are the 300 that I want. That's all I want. And God gives him a plan. He gives him a rescue plan. And he says, now do this. And when you do this, you'll beat the Midianites. So they do it. And all the Midianites kill themselves. They fall on their own swords in the middle of the night. The battle is epic. Gideon wins because God did it. And Israel was set free that day. And God says this in Isaiah 9. He says, just like it was in the day of Midian, in the midst of darkness, I'm sending an undercover agent that will rescue the people. And when he does, he says, everybody will say, there is no one like our God. Jesus is like no other. God is like no other. And God successfully got his man into this world undercover, born of a virgin, born in a manger, with nobody knowing anything. He slipped in and he slipped out. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. I hope you got something out of this. Listen, next now that when you see Christmas, you need to look at, man, that was the greatest undercover rescue mission 
of all time. And I guarantee you, your family and friends are going to say, what? I thought it was just a baby in a manger. Oh, let me tell you. Ha, ha, ha. Praise the Lord. God is good. He rescued you and me. He came in and broke the chains of bondage. He set us free. He shined the light upon us. He broke every chain that was against us. He broke every debt that was against us. He healed every sickness and disease that came our way. He set us free from lack and poverty. Everything demonic that is of this world, Jesus came and he rescued us. Stand to your feet, please. <laughs>